And a very good evening to you and welcome to Politics 101. David Hines here on a Wednesday evening, uh, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, this evening, of course, our interview is going to be with Mr. Rav Ram Koran, uh, former Speaker of the House, former member of uh, GCOM, I think he served there sometime in the 1970s, um, former member of the PPP and founder member of ANOG, um, a, a new and united Guyana. He'll be joining us later on uh, for the interview. I would like to welcome all those of you joining us from Guyana. You're joining us from the rest of the Caribbean and uh, North America, of course. Um, lots of you in the United States of America and Canada. Uh, wherever you're joining us from, welcome to Politics 101. And uh, if you're joining us from uh, Europe, uh, welcome down to uh, the program. Uh, those of you who are joining us from England, um, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, um, whichever of those titles um, you wish to use, um, welcome to Politics 101. Those of you who are in the um, larger European continent, welcome to Politics 101. If you're joining us from anywhere in the world, we're in the world. Welcome to Politics 101. Of course, um, our Guyanese viewers are the majority. Welcome. Uh, please, of course, um, share the link and let everyone know that Politics 101 is on tonight. We had a little break and we came back last night. Um, we had a riveting program with Dr. Henry Jeffrey. Those of you who are on YouTube, we have a large following on YouTube and we like to welcome you. We always seem to forget. Those of you joining us from Cams TV, um, Cams TV um, platform, welcome to Politics 101. You're joining us from uh, Politics 101. Uh, some of you I know uh, would be uh, joining us, um, if you will, from uh, uh, the Sherrod Duncan platform, I'd like to welcome you, welcome you to Politics uh, 101. Um, a lot, a lot has been happening and um, we are trying to catch up, having been away for a week um from 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 the scene uh but we're back we're back after a little break and um we would like to welcome you all down uh to the show as i said ralph ram koran is expected to join us um later on um uh, uh and um, we'll take the opportunity to talk to ralph about a number of topical issues um, uh, as they relate to Guyana. We have tracking, of course, um, the uh, ridiculous 8% uh, um, that has been uh, offered to workers, public servants, behind the backs of their unions. Um, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But uh, the government does that year after year, ignoring the collective bargaining principles that, um, uh, that are enshrined in our law, that, that the government must engage with the workers' representatives, the unions. Those are rights that we have struggled for over the years. In fact, it's one of the reasons that the British invaded Guyana um, in 1953, because it was the passage of the law that gave 
um, that gave uh, workers the right to bargain through their trade unions. And when that bill was passed, um, the British used that as the occasion uh, to invade Guyana with the claim that Guyana was poised to become a communist country, which of course went against the political um, the political stance of Britain and the rest of the rest of the world um, during the Cold War. So the right, the workers' right to bargain is a sacred right, a right that was won through the blood and sweat of all people. And in 2022, to see a government continuing to flaunt, flout, sorry, um, that right, continue to ignore that right, um, and giving the workers what they feel like, 8%. Think if you're a public servant, working for $100,000, um, 8% of $100,000 is $8,000. When they finish taxing, then you see what they get. And the public servants have had to struggle, continue to struggle for better wages, Public servants, of course, run the government, take public servants away. Who will provide the government services? Whether it's your passport or your birth certificate. Whether you're going to look after your NIS. Whether it's the people who teach your children, which is the nurses, the military people, the police, the soldier. Public servants are essential workers. They are essential workers, essential to the functioning of the government. And to continue to treat the workers in that way, in a government that is boasting of a lot of money, a lot of money, look at the growth rate that they're talking about. Look at the m amount of money over $300 million extra that the government is raking in just this year from the rise in the price of oil as a result of the Ukraine war. Yet, workers can only get 8%. And the government is boasting of throwing money here and giving money to fishermen and women and money to sugar workers and money to this group and that group. Yet your workers who are essential to the functioning of your government, you fail to give them a substantial, substantial wage increase. Um, economists are saying that given the rising cost of living, the inflation, given everything, at a minimum, at a minimum, the public servant should be getting 15%. Um, some trade unionists are um, saying a 25% raise is really um, what is needed, but at a minimum, 15%. Yet the government is giving 8%. And it's not giving 8% after bargaining with the trade unions, it's giving 8%. Um, uh, on its own. Welcome to Politics 101. We are waiting on uh, Mr. Rav Ramkaran, who is expected to join us um, as we continue our um, discussion um, on the pertinent issues of the day. Of course, we are in the midst of um, local government elections which have been announced next year, I think it's March, and the challenge as to whether the opposition should, um, should participate in those elections. Um, 
are thing. Let's see, I think I have Mr. Ramkarani. Good evening, Mr. Ramkaran. Oh, okay, okay. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Ramkaran is, um, is uh, caught up in an emergency. Hopefully, he will be able to sort that out and um, join us um, later on. Um, um, so yes, um, a, a local government elections are on the way, and uh, the issue therefore is whether the opposition uh, should participate um, in those elections or not. And uh, the People's National Congress, which is the uh, party with the largest constituency in the opposition, has said that it is likely to take that pragmatic position of um, participating in the elections, um, despite the fact that it uh, contends that uh, the list is bloated and uh, that if it were not to participate in the elections, then uh, um, those constituencies would be open to the PPP. And so therefore the PNC has to make that hard decision whether it wants to turn, um, whether it wants, it wants to turn um, those constituencies over um, to the PPP. Very difficult decision um, to, to take because of course, if the PPP were to get control of Georgetown and New Amsterdam and Bartica and some of the other uh, municipalities, uh, some of the other NDCs, um, then it will have total power. It will have total power at the central government level. It will have total power at the local government level. And that then would, in a sense, um, legalize the one party state in the country. So um, quite a decision for the opposition uh, to make. And uh, um, one does not uh, um, envy the PNC to, to, for being in such, um, such a, a dilemma. Yes, um, the list is bloated. Everybody knows that. The government doesn't want to do anything about the list. Um, they're obviously benefiting from a bloater's list, a bloated list. And so they're not in any mood to change the list. They're hiding under the ruling by the Chief Justice that uh, um, people who are, who are in, on the National Register cannot be taken off because, you know, we extract the voters list from the register. And so therefore the court, the court has ruled from a legal standpoint, a constitutional standpoint, that it would fly in the face of the constitutional right to be registered if you were to take people off the list. So therefore that problem has to be solved by the legislature. The legislature has to pass laws, laws to clean the list. So it means that that decision has to be arrived at between the political parties, the PNC and the PPP. They have to agree on legislation to change the laws. You know, the court ruling as it is does not mean that the matter is over and that you can't clean the list. That is a matter for the legislature which is controlled by the two big parties. One party is willing, the PNC and the opposition are willing to begin to clean the list. 
there are all kinds of proposals have been made. But the PPP is trying all kinds of flimsy reasons not to clean the list, not to clean the list. At the level of GCOM, they're talking about biometrics and other ways and means of sanitizing the list. Even those proposals, the PPP is rejected. So they, they, they make the case is clear. The PPP does not want a clean voters list. What happens when you find yourself in such a situation where one of the major parties is blocking moves to lay the basis for a free and fair election? Because a, a voters list is essential to a free and fair election. Without a voters list, you're not going anywhere. And if the voters list is bloated, it means that uh, the possibility of it being used to violate the spirit and the letter of free and fair elections is very high. One may have said goes beyond possibility, it's a probability for the PPP to say, well, yes, the list is bloated, uh, but you can sort that out at the place of polling. It's ready to say, as Dr. Jeffrey said last night, look, you can steal. There's a possibility here for you to steal, but we're not going to block you from stealing. We are going to depend on you not to steal. So the PPP said, this list is bloated. There's a possibility that this list can be used to violate the spirit of free and fair elections. But we are not going to steal. So leave it there. The question is, how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to solve this problem? Dr. Jeffrey said last night, the problem has to be solved by a political solution, a political solution, a political solution, which means that the major political parties and the minor parties have to sit down and agree to solve the problem. It's a political solution. So, if those of you who've been following the newspapers would know that Attorney General Anil Nandlal has been lashing out at everyone who has challenged the voters list. Everyone, he's been lashing out left, right, and center. He's doing extra judicial work. He's not act, acting, although he signs as the Attorney General. He's really doing activist work, PPP work. We saw the interesting suggestion by a professor, Guyanese professor teaching in Germany. That professor pointed out that the voter turnout was spent at 70% at the last election. But he's saying, no, the voter turnout has to be more than 70%. Because of the bloated list, it means that a substantial number of people on the list could not vote because they're outside of the jurisdiction. They have no intentions of voting. So you really have to talk about 70% of the people who could vote, sorry, um, the turnout should be based on the number of people who were eligible to vote in the country. And he said, when you measure it like that, 
you get between 85 and 93 percent turnout. And he's arguing that in a country where people are not forced to vote legally, where voting is voluntary, 93 percent is too much. What it suggests is that there was chicanery. He's suggesting that. He didn't say that, but he's saying, if you have a voter turnout of 93%, in a country where voting is voluntary, then something is wrong. And of course, the Attorney General, um, I'll dismiss that. Oh, it's not a substantial argument. And so we continue to, we continue to have to contend with elections with a list that is blue. How do we change that? How do we change it? We have to get the two parties together to sit down. And if the parties are not sitting down, then how do we change that? Is it that the PPP is forcing the opposition to have to engage in extra parliamentary activity? Many of you on this program have been bemoaning the fact that the opposition has not been aggressive enough in terms of forcing the PPP to back down on the rampage that it's on, to back off from the rampage. You know, we say that the opposition is weak. Well, look, there are accepted democratic norms of political engagement. You go to parliament, you engage in parliament, you engage in peaceful protests when it's possible. You try to use whatever leeway the opposition has in terms of service committees and so on and so forth. Now, under any system that's difficult, but under a winner-take-all system, where the governing party has the majority and so therefore is able to block, is able to block the use of those devices that are open to the opposition. It means that they've closed all the opposition from any meaningful democratic engagement. You see, the Westminster democracy assumes that the government will govern based on both the letter and the spirit of the law. The letter of the law says the majority wins. The spirit of the law says that even in a system where the majority theoretically wins, it must, the system must be inclusive. So we have the dilemma in our Westminster system of giving an advantage theoretically to the winner or to the ruling party while at the same time being inclusive. That's how politics work. It's, it's politics as in life. How do you balance that? How do you balance a system that gives the majority the advantage, but then the system assumes inclusivity? It means, therefore, that the system is appealing to the national sensitivities of the parties. The system assumes that parties are concerned not just with their own power, but the good of the country. For the system to work, the actors have to be concerned, yes, about their own advantage, but also and perhaps more importantly, concern about the country. And that's where the inclusive part comes in. 
so that inclusivity is meant to block the majority from moving towards a tyranny. So when the government does not engage in inclusivity, it is therefore governing as a tyranny, as an autocrat, as a dictator. That is what happens in a majoritarian democracy. When the opposition does not have any systemic checks and balances. Because at the end of the day, you, you know, you can oppose, but then the government uses its majority. So there are really no formal checks on the majoritarian government in our Guyana. The checks have to come from a desire by those who govern to include. And if they fail to do that, then the only checks are checks outside of the formal system. And I think that's what a lot of, a lot of people in this program and other program are arguing, that there are no formal checks on the government. And so, therefore, if you are going to check the government from continuing to go down the road of hyper-dictatorship, then those checks will have to come from outside of the formal system. You're not able to check the government in parliament. You're not able to check the government in the institutions of government. Our courts are very conservative. And they've shown no inclination to go in beyond formal interpretations of the law. And so the court is not prepared to play a revolutionary role as let's say the court in America in the 1950s and 60s, the Warren Court that played such an important role in breaking down the system of segregation in America. Our court in Guyana is not prepared to go that way. So the court is not prepared to, 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 to hold the government to both the spirit and the letter of the law. We've seen our court throws out the very important election petition based on the fact that papers were solved, solved late. That's, that's, that's a minimalist, minimalist reading of the law. Very minimalist. A court that is more maximalist in terms of its gaze would have said, yes, the papers were solvely. Yes, the court has the discretion to throw out this case. But this matter is so important to governance, it's so important to stability, it's so important to who governs that we are going to use our other discretion. And that is in spite of the technical discretion, we are going to allow this petition to be heard. The court only used one of its discretions, and that is the easy way. Papers were solved late. We have the discretion to throw the case, and we throw it out, story done. But the court has another discretion, as I'm arguing. And that is to say, given the larger constitutional and legal implications of this, this, this decision, we are going to use our other discretion. 
And that is we're going to allow the, 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 the petition to go through. The court, therefore, is no help when it comes to, to, to helping to bring about a political solution. So the parliament, because the PPP is a majority, does not play any revolutionary role. The court is not going to play any revolutionary role, as we have seen. So where does that leave the opposition? Where does that leave the opposition? Where is the opposition going to find the scope to challenge a government that is prepared not to give one inch of formal space? I throw that question out to you. I know you know the answer to those questions. I know. We have had to grapple with that issue throughout our independence. Throughout our independence, we have had to grapple with that issue that when the doors are closed to formal political engagement, what happens? I pose that question to you, but our guest is there, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran is here and waste no time in getting Mr. Ralph Ramkaran on. I apologize. Good evening to you, David, and your guests. I apologize for the late entry, and I also apologize for having to use my telephone, but um, I haven't been able to get me contact through my computer, which has a bigger screen, but nevertheless, I'm here. You're here. Um, Ralph, um, uh, you know, in, in, in speaking to you, you're speaking to someone who has been involved in our politics for 50 years and more. I know you as a young man coming into politics in the 1970s. Um, I know you were very active in the PPP and you serve in some pivotal positions. Um, you, you serve in TECOM at one point, right? I serve as, <laughs> as what? In TECOM. I did uh, for three elections, 92, 97, and 01. And 01. Do yeah. you serve as speaker of the National Assembly? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. And, and, um, and so, therefore, you are not just a marginal voice um, in our politics. And so, therefore, um, when you pronounce on issues, you bring to um, the fore all that experience over a period of time. And, you know, political experience, as you know, Ralph, is, is, is a very, very important um, uh, uh, commodity. Um, let, let me start off by um, getting your views here on a subject that I've been discussing while I was waiting on you. And that is, um, what happens in a winner-take-all majoritarian system when um, the ruling party um, uh, 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 takes up all of the formal political space? Um, what, what, then, what then is the role of the opposition in such an environment? I mean, whether one agrees with the opposition or not, the claim is that the government uh, is using up all of the formal space um, in parliament, the opposition, you would know that well as speaker, um, the opposition doesn't get, get its way in parliament, the government uses its majority, um, the service commissions, um, uh, where the opposition should have some say. Um, there are all kinds of shenanigans um, there. There are the, um, the committees, and you will know that very well because you were part of the um, constitutional reform um, in 2000, um, that, that the, the committees in parliament were meant to bring some kind of democratic involvement on the part of the opposition. But as we have seen, either the opposition is not taking full use of those opportunities or the government is not allowing the opposition to take 
full use of those opportunities. What happens when there is not balance between um, uh, majority rule and inclusiveness? Because I think that's what we, um, we are facing in Guyana, we have faced since independence, how to balance majority rule with inclusiveness. Well, Guyana is a special case. Uh, in the rest of the Caribbean, um, with the um, Westminster system, which Guyana shares with a little bit of mod modification, um, you have the same, um, you have a system where a party gets into office and it, it, um, it dominates the, all the political space. It takes, um, it gets the service commissions and all the other um, bodies, uh, parliamentary committees and everything, it has a majority. But in Caribbean, in the Caribbean, in, in the rest of the Caribbean outside of Guyana, political parties, there is no huge ethnic minority. In Guyana, there is no majority, but there is a large ethnic um, group that, is in a minority. Um, well, there is Trinidad, of course. But all these countries change governments every two elections, every two election cycle, the, or maybe three. These, all the Caribbean countries, well, there, there, there are some, there are some exceptions, like St. Vincent, for example where Ralph Gonzalez has been in office for a long time. But in those countries, governments change, including, including St. Vincent. Guyana, the government doesn't change because of an inbuilt ethnic group that is larger than all the other ethnic groups. That is to say, the Indians. Now, Many people have said, including yourself and me and others, have said that because this return at elections brings in only one political party, this majoritarian system in Guyana needs to have some kind of modification in order to ensure that the opposition has a meaningful say. Um, in the governance of the country. Many of us have proposed a shared governance. Jagan, up to 1992, had proposed a winner, a system of winner does not take all. PNC in the late 90s had, well, not officially, but in the late 90s had advocated shared governance. And in 2002, Desmond Hoyt accepted that principle. In the last elections, not the la elections before the last, APNO AFC at the instigation, you had reminded us, at the instigation or the pressure from the AFC, had introduced in its manifesto a system of sheer governance. All of these things, all of these things were done because of the permanent, of, because of the PPP, holding permanent political office in Guyana, which some argue is a detraction from democracy. Now, you have to add it to that, a particular and specific ethnic situation in Guyana. Maybe other countries it was the same, but it hasn't turned out as in Guyana. Trinidad, I suppose it was the same. Maybe Suriname as well. I'm not too familiar with that situation. But from the time Indians landed here in 1838 and thereafter, and then they came in large numbers, Africans felt swamped. Now I use the word swamp because it has been used. And this has been a very serious problem in Guyana. As it developed, the Indians developed their own problem of security and otherwise. But if you go back to the debate at the Federation, at the Federation time, a lot has been spoken about Jagan's attitude to the Federation and or accused of racism and so on. But the focus on that has detracted 
from the African feelings and the African view at the Federation time. And the African view was that, look, we need to join with our African brothers and sisters in the Caribbean because we will be swamped by Indians in Guyana. So this problem, this, re this ethnic problem has existed for a very long time. It got its, ex I'm sorry to talk so long. Well, I'll come to an end in a minute. But it, and it got its expression at, at Federation time. It got its expression in the early 60s in violence. It got its expression in Guyana from, from 2003, 2008 in, in criminal violence. So this pro and you got the you got you're getting its expression now in allegations of marginalization and discrimination. So this problem is not going to go away. It's not going to leave us. And therefore, it's a matter of importance that people who talk about these things should point to this problem and seek solutions. We have a solution. I have a solution. I've written and spoke about it dozens and dozens of times. If there are solutions, we, we'd like to hear about them. That's the majoritarian system is not working towards the political stability in Guyana. The, the majoritarian system, as presently configured, is not conducive to political stability in Guyana. That's my view. And, and Raf, let me let me let me let me ask a related question. Um, because both major political parties have um, over time tried to get crossover votes in order to validate the one party governance. And we see the present government embarking on a strategy of going into African Guyanese communities and seeking to influence, I would think, trying to influence um, uh, uh, people from those constituencies to at least give the president and the people an air. And some people, very knowledgeable people, knowledgeable people are predicting that that would make a difference in that scenario that of you have, you have um, laid out there about how ethnicity and race play a role in terms of people's political behavior. Um, do you share the same optimism of some of our countrymen and women who think that this one Guyana intervention by the president is going to break this ethnic deadlock that we have been dealing with now for six, seven decades? Well, you know, you know, David, you were around in 1992 and you were very keenly interested as you have always been in politics. You have, your political career, a large part of it was dedicated to the removal of the PNC from office when they were in office. And the reason we all sought that is because the PNC had established a dictatorship and they had destroyed Guyana, the economy of Guyana, that is. In 1992, however, to the shock and amazement of many people, the African people turned out and gave the PNC the same vote that the PNC had had at the last free and fair elections in 1964. And from 1992 onwards, they have given the PNC the same vote. Now, I, I welcome President Ali going to all communities in Guyana, including African communities. And I think Aubrey Norton should do the same. But we have to be realistic. Nothing has happened so far to suggest to me that the ethno-political makeup of our party system is going to change dramatically. Now, in 2006, the PNC, under the leadership of Corbyn, lost six seats, five seats. 
And those five seats went to the AFC. So what happened is a section of the PNC support drifted or left and went to the AFC. I don't know what section that is, but some people say it was the middle class people. I have no idea why there was there was this problem with Corbyn. Particularly, there was an internal problem coming from the younger members of the leadership of the PNC. Now, I don't know why, but that vote quickly returned in 19, in the next elections, 2011, when Mr. Corbyn was no longer leader of the PNC. So even if President Ali were to go in communities and do political work in the communities and pass over funds for the um, for the development works and so on. I don't think that is going to alter the political makeup of the country in any significant way. But I would urge that Aubrey Norton should do the same. You see, David, the Guyanese people are welcoming people. When President Ali goes to African villages, African people turn out and welcome him. Just as they welcomed their own leaders, but we're not talking about their own leaders, just as they welcomed Barajagde when he went, and just as they welcomed Cherry Jagan when he went, they're welcoming people um, who extend courtesy to their leaders. That does not, has never ever translated into votes. And I don't know that. President Ali's visits, even bearing gifts, is going to translate into votes. He has a right to go, and I think Mr. Corbyn should take the opportunity to do the same. I think you mean Mr. Get, Norton. I think he will get the same the same welcome. Yes. Ralph from Koran joining us here and giving us is in terms of the big political um, issues uh, um, that we continue to face uh, um, in Guyana. Ralph, you have, uh, you have said a lot. Um, since the Coffee 250 conference in August, that had as a steam Guyana an emerging apartheid state. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people, but mostly on the, on the PPP side also, have said a lot. There is an argument that Guyana cannot be an apartheid state because our laws um, uh, do not allow for an apartheid state. But as I like to remind lawyers and other um, political people, that there is de jure um, segregation, de jure apartheid, and uh, there is de facto apartheid. And that um, apartheid is used um, was used not only to describe what happened in, what happened in South Africa, Zimbabwe, and, and, and Namibia, but it um, was used by none other than Jimmy Carter to describe what's happening um, uh, in the Middle East with Israel and the Palestine. Um, in fact, the Coffee 250 was not the first um, uh, group to say that Guyana is an apartheid state. The Kaito News in an editorial said the same thing. I can rights coming in to the country because of our oil. There is developing two, two Guyanese society. So the description of Guyana's an emerging apartheid state is not new, first. And secondly, apartheid is not confined just to laws. And thirdly, apartheid is not confined just to the experience in South Africa. What says you? Well, I, I indeed wrote about the issue and it emerged. And what I pointed out was that <clears throat> apartheid is a system that was based on the legal discrimination against people of a different race, namely um, Africans in South Africa. And as you know, it has a long history. And then the biggest, the biggest, um, 
the biggest um, claim of apartheid after South Africa was in Israel. And President Carter started that when some years ago, 10 or more years ago, when he wrote, wrote a book. But recent people, like people in Israel, there's a, an organization, I don't remember the name, which first, this is an Israeli organization, which then went about an issue, which issue, did an analysis of the laws and the policies which were carried out by the, not only policy, the laws which were implemented by the Israeli government and showed that by the imposition of those laws, apartheid is being created or has been created in by Israel in Palestine. And after that came another United Nations agency followed up on that work and pointed out again that there's a legal system which has been established by Israel in Palestine, buttressed by Israeli policies which carry out discrimination, which indicates that a, an apartheid state has been created. Now, apartheid is a very emotive word and very emotive issue. In Guyana, there is no such there are no such laws, that's the first thing. And I'm not going to get into the issue of whether there's discrimination or not. But apart from there being no laws which discriminates against people of different ethnicities, Guyana has a very large employment situation where for example, the sugar industry, there are Indians working there. In agriculture, Indians dominate there. But in the public service, in the civil service, in the teaching profession, in the military, in the police, uh, in the nursing profession, in the teaching profession, Africans dominate. They work normally, they live normally. Um, whether there's discrimination or not in terms of promotion, I'm not going to get in that issue. I don't know. But you can't, you don't have, you have a situation where half the country, where the entire public services is, employs African people. So I don't know on the basis of official policies of discrimination where, how you can categorize Guyana in the same way as you categorize awful places like South Apartheid, South Africa, or Palestine, where people are being killed every day, and where children are imprisoned. Guyana, that, is not, that doesn't exist in Guyana. Hello? Oh, yeah, here I am. Yeah. Yes, Ralph, you would remember in the 1970s, there was this disagreement between the PPP and the WPA, where the PPP was saying that the PNC government was a creeping dictatorship, and the WPA was saying it was a full-fledged dictatorship. Can't you see uh, an equation about an apartheid state? based on policies, um, because between the PPP creeping dictatorship and uh, the African organizations emerging um, apartheid state. Well, I, I think to, to go in that direction, you have to, you have to find some kind of laws that suggest that apartheid is being created or some kind of officially designated policies that apartheid is being created. Take the, take the Burmese and the Rohingya people. No one can doubt that the Burmese were, were applying policies of an apartheid nature on the Rohingya people. They had no rights. No rights whatsoever. 
they were confined in a particular area of, of Myanmar. They were deprived of all facilities, medical facilities, education facilities. It was an awful, awful situation. They were very often they were raised against the, the Rohingya people. Many were killed until eventually they took up arms and they had this big conflagration and they were expelled. Now, Burma may not have had a classic apartheid regime as in South Africa and to a limited ex and to a lesser extent at Israel towards Palestine. But nevertheless, one can advance the argument in the case of, of Myanmar that they were carrying out apartheid-like policies towards the Rohingya people. You have a situation here in Guyana where Africans are, 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 are I don't want to use the word dominate, because dominate doesn't sound like a right, right language to use in this situation. Where they are, where they are, they are employed in, in 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 very very important industries, African population, the African people control the military in this country. That's not, that's not nothing. That's not nothing at all. All the leaders in the, in the discipline services are African. Well, the vast majority. That's not nothing when you're considering the issue of apartheid. And, and, and rather, I'm glad you went there. There is, a, there, is a, there is a second step in that story, in that narrative. Yes, Africans control the public service, they control the military, the teaching profession, and so on. But the government gives them 8% salary raise behind the backs of their union. Isn't that a apartheid like policy despite the domination in numbers i, I don't Tell think me. so Look, the public service the public service problem is a different problem the the the, the afno afc government treated the the gpsu the identical way the pvp has treated the the PSU. yes so so yes the, so but the, this government has money that is showing around to a lot of its own constituencies, Ralph, and it's giving the constituency, giving the constituency that is not its natural constituency, it's giving them less than it's showing out to the other constituencies. Oh, 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 at least that's discrimination, no? Well, I, I know, I'm, I'm not aware of that. I don't know that, but I, I don't follow these things with such great, great um with such great care but um look I, I the public service problem is a is a different problem it's not it's not a problem that has to do with discrimination or the public service has a, a problem in in terms of you know its approach representation all kinds of all kinds of stuff it's leadership Right. Ralph Ramkoran here giving us his views on some uh, very controversial subjects. It's not always easy to discuss these subjects. I mean, we know some of us have a kind of um, black and white approach. You know, it's either this or that. Um, but some of these issues are indeed complex. And one uh, has to, you know, talk them through even, even if one does not arrive at the conclusions, the definitive conclusions that a lot of you um, uh, 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 are expecting us to come to, at least we would have talked through um, the issue. Ralph, you have, um, you have had some, you have written about the rise of this social media and its uh, ability to influence or not to influence our politics. What are your thoughts? of the use of social media as a form of political mobilization. Is it um, hurting our country? Is it, some people have argued that it's, um, it's hurting race, race relations. It's, um, it, 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 it leans on the side of um, political in, encouraging political instability. What do you think? Is it a positive development or not? Well, I, I think this, 
whether we like it or not, social media is here to stay. And whether we like it or not, social media, media is going to have a very great impact on the political process in Guyana. We must not, however, make the mistake of believing that social media is going to influence the fundamentals, at least in Guyana. It plays a big, I think it plays a bigger role in the United States. Um, if you listen to the United States, some United States politics, they, they, they argue that the Russians, if you listen to some of them, they argue that the Russians influenced, seriously influenced the 2016 or the, 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 the year that Trump won the elections. Of course, that's rubbish. But we, we have to be careful that we don't overestimate the impact of social media. I think it's important, but it's just one of the one of the means by which we can and very effective means of which we can communicate some some social media operations i don't look at at all i just see the name of the people who are promoting it and don't bother to look some i do look i learn a lot from social media i look at professor marshima on um on youtube in relation to the war in the Russian and Ukraine, the Russia-Ukraine war in, in, that's going on at the moment. Morshaima is a professor of uh, um, politics and, and distinguished professor in, in at the University of California. Uh, Morshaima is, is, um, is uh, a member of the U.S. establishment. He, he, was, he, was, he was educated at West Point. He, was served, served in the Air Force, he was an officer in the Air Force. He was a member of the, he was an advisor to the U.S. intelligence agency. So this is a man who has a completely different view about the war. So it helps and it promotes opinions. It promotes country opinions. So social media is extremely important, but I don't believe that fund, it will affect the fundamental position in Guyana, it has carried it has carried the issue of of the claims of discrimination and marginalization by APNO AFC very far. We're clear, we've seen that, we've done that. But whether it will create a different political situation in Guyana, I'm not sure about that. Uh, not so soon. Ralph, um, let, let me um, uh, get you here on a certain uh, issue that you have also written about, and that is the attitude of the United States to the present government. Um, I think all of us would agree that the United States played a role um, during the 2020 impasse. Um, there are different interpretations of that role. But over the last year, year and a half, the United States through various officials, and you you have enumerated them in one of your columns. I've been calling on this government um, uh, for inclusive um, governance, fair um, uh, distribution of wealth, and corruption. Um, uh, is the government listening? Um, are those um, positions by the United States Mayor or are they fundamental to the political development um, uh, at the present moment? What the question? The, the question is the pronouncements by the United States government from its various officials, the Secretary of State recently we had, the um, Ambassador Sarah Ann Lynch, um, yeah. the Vice President. Um, are these yeah. just mere by the way, political diplomatic statements or are they sending fundamental message to our country no, 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 through no, the government? No, no, no. I, I don't think they're merely diplomatic statements. I am sure the government is feeling the pressure. I think the United States has taken a, a strong position 
and they are seeking from the government um, a path. They are trying to push the government in a path of inclusiveness. Now, the United States is clearly leaving what they mean by inclusiveness to Guyana, to the Guyana government and to the Guyana political parties to determine what the inclusive part means. But that part has been under debate in Guyana for many, many years. So there are all kinds of possibilities here. And I think that and not only the Guyana, not only the U.S. administration and its local representative here, the ambassador, but you have seen the, the, what has been going on with congressmen, Jeffries, for example. Now, for whatever reason, Jeffries made a statement about Guyana, probably political reasons and because of his constituency and all of that. And whoever has, 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 has encouraged him to make those statements, and whoever has encouraged Letitia James, the New York Attorney General, to do so, the fact is that they're doing so. And the fact is that the Guyana government, um, as, as you know, today um, or yesterday, um, Jeffries has been elected the leader of the Democratic Party in Congress. So the government must be feeling the pressure from all of these forces. And therefore, I think this is a very serious position that, um, that the government faces. And it doesn't seem as if it is paying heed. There's no indication that it's paying heed. The only heed it's paying appears to be this one Guyana and that, um, and that President Ali is visiting communities where, where all kinds of communities, African villages and so on, where he's welcome. The African people are a welcoming people and therefore, and, and they welcome all their leaders, as I've mentioned. But if the government believes that that is um, inclusiveness, the U.S. government is clearly not buying it because the ambassador would not have made the statement that she made recently, very recently. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, a, it's a serious problem the government faces, and, and I, I, I am baffled. It's really baffling that they are just ignoring the... Um, the government. As these, these people were your colleagues, some of them I told you said publicly recently are still your friends. But these were colleagues that you sat with in the various councils of the PPP party and government. Um, why do you think that they seem to be appearing so flippant in the face of these pronouncements by the Americans? I mean, given what you know of the inner workings of the party and the government, of course, in 10 years, a lot has changed. I'm, I'm granting that. But um, you know some of the players because you sat to them. I don't. <laughs> Cherry Jagan was a person who you, one could influence. You, you know that. I. I yes. when, when, in the 70s and the 80s, I had regular meetings with him and so on, on a, on a structured basis, and, and, and many other people. And you know, there was a, always a story that us young people growing up in the PAP had, is when you go to Freedom House, don't stand up in the corridor. Go into a room and lock the door. Because if you are in a corridor lurking about, and Cherry comes out, sometimes he comes up out to stretch his legs, Sometimes he comes out to go to the washroom or something. And he sees you lurking about. He calls you and finds political work for you to do. Or calls you and has a conversation with you. Now, when the leadership of the people... And, and, and you could influence Ch Chedi Jagan and, and talk about these things. Now, when the leadership of Chedi Jagan changed, there was... When Chair Jagan left the scene, there was a gradual, um, there was a gradual change in the manner in which these things were discussed, and the manner in which 
one. You you didn't fear to be in the corridor anymore because nobody was in the corridor in Freedom House. The, the people were in office of the president. And if you didn't have a job in that area, nobody bothered you at Freedom House. But the decision-making process changed, and it was no longer easy to influence um, the leadership uh, to take consideration of some of these things. Um, so I, I really have no way to analyze, to understand what's going on. I have no contact with the leadership of the PVP, or, or, uh, you know, on a regular basis. And even if I were to have contact in relation to the matters that I'm interested in, like the Venezuela border Guyana issue, no, no issue of, of policy in relation to politics come up. The only thing I do is write in the papers. So I can't answer you. I, I don't know what is the thinking. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea of why we are not seeing any kind of movement in that direction. I remember, you know, in 2003, the PVP put out a paper called, um, I forget the paper, I, I wrote it, um, a paper on, oh, uh, talking about shared governance and so on. Yeah, I remember that paper. Yeah. It was called Inclusive yeah. Governance or something, something like that. But I remember it. There's a big, there's a big, um, there's a big conference at State House with official, government officials, party officials, uh, diplomats, and so on, where the paper was read. But the reason for that, and where, where President Jack, then President Jack, they promised that as soon as the implementation of the constitutional reform, you had the constitutional reform commission which put in its report. And you had the constitutional reforms were passed in Parliament in 2001, a whole long list of legislation which amended the Constitution. And then you had to implement all these bodies which were, <clears throat> which had been established. And the, but the implementation of these bodies required a lot of discussion between the PNC and the, and the PPP, a lot of discussion. So what President Jacques Dill then said was, look, we will have these discussions, we'll establish these bodies. As soon as they're established and functioning, we'll go to the next stage. That is to see what further measures we can take to have inclusiveness. <clears throat> now, that never happened, of course. But the reason why the paper was prepared and this elaborate scheme was done to announce this policy and so on was because of pressure from the diplomatic community. Mm -hmm. It was because of pressure from the diplomatic community. I know that. I can't say how I know that, but I know that. Now, why is it the same pressure is not being applied? And this time the pressure has come from the U.S. Secretary of State and the Vice President. This is not ordinary pressure. So why is it not resonating now? I don't know. I can't say. I'm baffled. Serious questions being raised here. Ralph, you left the PPP in unfortunate circumstances. Um, you've written about it um, recently on um, the um, Gildari Freddy Kisun show. You went over it uh, and so on. So we wouldn't dwell on that here. But I want to ask you what lessons have you learned about politics in general and politic, party politics in Guyana coming out of that experience? Well, you know, I, the lesson I learned is that political parties and the leaderships of political parties must be tolerant, must be um, accept contrary views. As a matter of fact, political parties should, leadership of political parties should encourage differing views. Presidents and political leaders should court opposing views and should have free and full discussion on opposing views and that's the only way in which um, 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 you can have 
constructive solutions emerging from problems. If you are, if you suppress views and if you discourage people from expressing country views, promoting country views, and so on. You're looking for trouble down the road. It's not going to happen now, but down the road you're getting getting into trouble. And I found that um, that I found that the one of the problems that that I had faced. But when I left, it wasn't for an, a single issue. It was because of, of of a long series of of issues along the same vein that. Um, the debate was not the way it should be and encouragement of country views was not something which um had which had once existed in the ppp but had not um had declined you know when cherry was was um you know, i'm you know, i'm not here worshiping him i'm, I'm just mentioning that if, if there's a meeting <coughs> and somebody's persistently silent, he doesn't allow it. He calls on the person to speak. Come on, what I haven't heard you on this matter. Not because <laughs> he particularly wants to hear him, but, but because he wants to know what your views are. So, and, and that had declined. And that was the accumulation of that had, was responsible for. And I, I don't think it has been restored. Has been restored. Uh, in that interview uh, last week, there, Ralph, you said something that, uh, as a political observer, um, jumped out at me. And that is, you revealed that Dude Not Sing, um, who served as Attorney General um, from 2001, I think, to 2009, and Sam Hines, the Prime Minister, had both um, tendered their resignation. You didn't say whether it was from the government or the party or what. Um, were um, apparently encouraged to um, to to um, their their resignations weren't accepted, and that you felt that after they walked back on their resignation, they were abused. Um, Australian party secrets and all of that. Would you say that the same kind of issues that drove you to resign? Were at play in the two that sing and 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 um, uh, uh, Sam Hines issue, but well, not issues, but the same kind of political behavior. Um, Sam Hines actually wrote a letter. Sam Hines wrote a letter of resignation, and he was asked to withdraw it. the The reason was 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 not political disagreement, but disagreement on government policies. Um, and then the same thing for Do Not Sing. Do Not Sing didn't write a letter, but he said that he was going to resign, and then efforts were made to pacify him. But both were relation to disagreements on government policy. Well, we heard it here in Politics 101 um, uh, from um, Mr. Ralph Ramkaran that both Do Not Sing and the Prime Minister um, Sam Hines um, uh, I got threatened to resign or wrote a letter of resignation um, based on policy disagreements. And that's why sometimes you may not agree with the guests, but the guests will spend an hour. Uh, but they will, out of that hour, you will learn something that you will never learn. You couldn't learn that from me because I was not in the, in the PPP. And so therefore there is merit sometimes in having guests who do not share everything that you believe in. I mean, Ralph has come on this program knowing very well the political orientation of the audience, and that in itself um, is a form of movement. Um, Ralph, um, before you go, ANOC recently had its um, members' conference and elected a new leadership. I didn't see your name there. Have you retired? <laughs> what, what? Were you not voting in? Did you not seek office? What's going on? The current, the, I am time and a half the age of the oldest member elected to the Anug leadership. I think it's time to call it a day in active politics. 
and I wish the, the guys the best. I am um, I'm glad to see that it is the only party standing of the small parties. It's the only one standing. It has a it has elected a vibrant leadership. And these guys are all in their or the oldest person is in his or her early 40s. A lot of them are in their 30s and so on. So I, I think that's the um that's the type of age group that will attract the support in Guyana. And I would be very much out of place in, in that um in that group. I I have offered my my advice. I was asked. If I'd be available for advice, and I, by the current chairman, and I indicated that I would be any problems or issues they want guidance on or they want my views on, I'm available. So, but I think it's it's now time to call it a day in active politics. Ralph, you know you're the second active political person in Guyana who has done this. In 1987, Payana, if you remember, put out a statement saying that he is retiring from leadership politics and leaving it to the younger generation. He wasn't getting out of politics, but he felt that a new generation needed to take over and that he had issued that statement in 1987, similar to what you are saying here. It's not something that you see and hear from politicians. There must be something seductive about um, politics and party politics, but here you are. Um, making way for the people, not stepping away totally from in political commentary. In 2012, when I resigned from the PPP, in 2011, uh, in 2012, I told a few people, or 2011, I told a few people that when the PPP held its next Congress, which was due in 2012, it wasn't held in 2012, it was held several years later. But I told people in 2011, that when the PP held its next Congress, I will not offer myself for election to the PP Central Committee, and that I would be um, kind of declining from from active politics after then. After the elections were held in 2011, I was I was called out um, and asked to give certain help, give some guidance and help in. in interpreting the constitution for the purpose of election of speaker and that kind of thing. So I was called out and I, I remained, I, I continued um, my political activity expecting that, expecting still that I would leave politics whenever Congress came about. And then of course the event happened to me. So I was, had long planned resignation. And what happened in when ANUG was formed was that a few of us who got together, including Henry Jeffrey and others, saw the saw an opportunity for a third party to make some inroads, and that is why I dusted off my um my political shoes and came back in. Uh, but of course, it didn't happen. Anuk didn't do all that well. So here I am. Um, I stayed with Anup for a while, and it's it's succeeding. It's the only party in in, in that is, is the only one of the small parties that's left standing, and the people are very enthusiastic, and I hope that they do well. Ralph Ramkaran, political activist, um, PPP members, former speaker, former GCOM member, um, uh, uh, spending time with us here. Um, tonight, and it's always good to have um, uh, people with this kind of experience to come and uh, to share with us, even if we don't uh, agree with uh, um, uh, some of the position. And we endeavor to do that on this program, um, partly because that's the political orientation that I come from. I want to be partisan um, uh, without being a prison of your party and partisan ideas. Ralph, thank you very much for coming on. Any parting statements before you go? Well, I'm very happy to be on the program. And of course, I'm very happy to put a view that whether or not your audience, your audience supports it or not, I hope that the engagement 
is useful and helps us to open your eyes. I, I read it, I read everything that uh, is written by by um, by political opinion um, of all kinds of views, and it helps me to develop my own view. It helps me to have a sensitivity that even if I may not support a particular position, it helps me to be sensitive to to people who have such positions and to understand their positions and generally to understand the situation better. So I hope that whatever views I express will be taken in that in that light and that we all learn from each other by sharing with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. And um, tomorrow night, we are going to be partisan tomorrow night. We're going to have um, Lincoln Lewis and Coretta McDonald two trade unionists with partisan views, um, which you may be more comfortable with. They're going to be here tomorrow night to talk about that 8% increase in particular, um, but talk about where trade unionism and the workers' struggle stand in the context of contemporary politics. So join us tomorrow evening for a discussion with Lincoln Lewis and Coretta McDonald. Lewis, of course, is the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress. And Coretta McDonald is the President of the PUC. Tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, we will be here. Thank you all for joining us and for staying with us. We went over by an hour, by an half an hour tonight, but of course, uh, because um, uh, Brother Ralph got caught in some emergency stuff, but he showed up. Thank you. And I'm going to see you guys tomorrow evening.